This morning, if you'll notice the title of the message, either on the screen or on your outline that is there, it's True Christians Face Life with Prayer, and then it's part two. We only got through half of this message uh, last Sunday, and uh, I felt impressed for us to continue um, to be very careful to really see what this passage is talking about. We're right here at the home stretch at the end of the book of James. If you're looking at your outline there, what message is this? Up there at the top of the page, second line that is there, what, what number is this? 35. So we've looked at 35 messages from this little five-chapter book of James. James is a powerful small book. There's much wisdom in the book of James. There's much test in the book of James. In fact, look at the review in the context that is there. Um, and we look at this a little bit from last week, but also we're going to fly through this. If you're new with us this morning, notice I've left the first two filled in. Number one, this is the first letter written to the earliest churches of the New Testament. So if you're wondering where the New Testament begins, this is really it. You say, well, I thought it was Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. Well, yes, um, but not chronology. Cr cr how do I say it, Mr. Spee? <laughs> Chronologically, thank you. Not Chronologically. Um, chronologically, this is really the first letter written to the New Testament. Remember with me, Jesus ascends back to the Father. The disciples are going out. They're first in Jerusalem, and there in Jerusalem we see God doing great and mighty things. Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes, empowers the church. There, there are glorious numbers of people starting to believe upon Jesus Christ. And then what comes and hits the church in Jerusalem? Not a hurricane, but what? What hits the church in Jerusalem? Thank you. Persecution. Can everybody say persecution? persecution? Persecution does what to the church? It spreads the church out, moves them out of Jerusalem. And then they go spreading out across with these words of truth. And they go, and sure enough, over the next few years, the gospel spreads around the Mediterranean, up and around what is modern-day Turkey, all the way to uh, Greece, and then eventually to Italy, and all the way to France and Spain. And the gospel is spreading across North Africa, and the whole Mediterranean basin is being covered with the gospel. Many of those early Christians were Jewish. And so we see that here. As that was taking place, there were, even after about 10 years, there was a fair amount of people who they claimed to be Christians, but they didn't act like Christians. They even went to church, and they even submitted themselves to the apostles' teaching, but they weren't living it. And so the apostle, excuse me, James, the half-brother of Jesus, who is the pastor of the church in Jerusalem, writes these five chapters, writes this little letter, um, to straighten some of that out. Look at number two there. Look what it says. The letter of James gives several tests to help you determine if you're a true Christian. And these tests apply to us today. Several different tests. You can read them. You can go back and listen to the messages that we've looked at over these last few months. Look at number three. This letter has two primary functions. The first bullet point says, revealing what kind of faith? Faulty faith, and that is exposing what? Fake Christians. That's a real issue. That's not only a real issue to James, but in our culturally Christian society of America, you say, well, I've been watching the news. I don't think we're too culturally Christian anymore. And I would say, I kind of agree with you. Much of that is falling down and, and going away. But let me tell you, what we see is that real Christianity is rising up out of the darkness. I believe that Sheridan Hills is part of that. I believe that Lighthouse Community Church on US 1 is part of that. I believe, believe that St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church is part of that. People who hold on to the gospel, who want to live by the gospel, who remember that the only hope is Jesus, these are the ones that even when everything starts to fade away in quote-unquote a culturally Christian society, that true Christianity continues to rise up. And so that's what we see. This is the exposing of that. Look at the next one there. Another thing that James wants to do is give godly wisdom. This is the way of life for who? Fill it in. True Christians. This is the way of life for true Christians. 
He's saying, you can't, you can't just say whatever you want to say. Your tongue needs to be under control. He has a whole section in there on the tongue. He, he says, you can't just be partial toward rich people and leave the poor people out. You can't be partial toward people that are like you or the people that, that you like versus the ones that you don't like. He says, no, God is a, is a God of impartiality, and you are to reflect that truth in him. He goes on to talk about various issues, and one of those big issues, as we see here, is number four. If you would, look at number four. Pastor James now circles back on the true Christian's response to what? Suffering. You know, the big question of what about pain and suffering? It was a question then, just like it's a question now. In fact, notice underneath number four, the first bullet point there is, circle the word begins. He begins with this issue. Look at verse two in James chapter one, and you will see, consider it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, testings, persecutions, sicknesses, illnesses, disappointments. It, he begins with this and circle the word ends. He ends with this issue, which is where we are now. So here we are at the end of the book of James, and the issue of suffering comes up again because it is such a real issue when it comes to living a life of faith in a fallen world. Notice number five. We must recognize, this is so important for us, the reality, the reality of suffering in a fallen world. That first bullet point there just, I believe, is important that we need to get. The issue of pain and suffering is often a tremendous stumbling block for both non-Christians and for Christians. Very often, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how God can be all-powerful, and yet we see these things that are so ungodly. We see these things that seem to be so out of control. We see these things in our world, either on a global scale or even in our own lives that hurt or that are, are complete wreckage of certain relationships or certain issues in our lives, and, and it can become a stumbling block. The suffering can become a stumbling block. Look at the second bullet point underneath number five. Strong, and get ready to say it out loud with me, Strong, mature Christians typically have a solid what? Very good. Theology of suffering. You won't find strong, mature Christians with a poor theology of suffering. The theology of suffering, what you believe about suffering, if it is based upon God's word, will actually fuel and grow your faith. But very often when suffering comes to a Christian that hasn't been discipled well, a Christian that hasn't been taught the truth, hasn't been taught the Word of God, suffering comes and knocks the feet out from underneath them like a mighty wave down here on Hollywood Beach to a toddler. God calls us to verse ourselves well in his word so that in times of blessing we may honor him and praise him and not leave him and in times of suffering we may honor him and bless him and not leave him because this is a life to be lived by faith faith when things go well and things when faith when things do not go well for us look at the third bullet point there our fall into sin can you circle the word fall that's a very important issue for us. Teachers, as you are teaching and as you are imparting knowledge and truth to our kids this year, the theology of the fall is an important thing for us to teach them. That, that when we fall out of innocence, when we, fall, when, when we did fall out as a human race, when Adam and Eve not only literally, but also as representatives of the human race, fall into sin, and that transmission of sin is down through the ages. We see that throughout the Scripture, and we only have to look at our own heart or at our own toddler children. You don't have to teach small children to do the wrong thing, do you? Do you have to teach them to have a tantrum? No. They're pretty good at that right away. Do you have to teach them to lie? You don't have to teach them to lie. They will quickly do that on their own. Do you have to teach them 
to hoard and to be greedy and to not share. No, you don't have to teach them to do that. That's naturally what they want to do. They want to look at self and think about self. All of this is part of our fallen nature. And this is an important area for us to understand, showing us our need for a Savior. And that is exactly what the law does. The law real, helps us see, uh, from the Old Testament, the Torah, helps us see that we need God. We cannot keep the law on ourselves. So fill this in. Our fall into sin results in separation, suffering, and death. And we looked at that last week, Genesis chapter 3, the fall, Isaiah 59, you're cut off from God, 1 Corinthians 15, even Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is what? Is death. We're cut off from God, cut off from the eternal life in which he is designed. So, notice the last one that's here. In this fallen state, God sovereignly uses pain and suffering to bring us to himself. In his sovereignty, he uses the difficulties of this life very, very often to bring us to himself. Notice, secondly, he uses them to grow us. He grows us through pressure and pain. And not only that, but most, not, not intuitively, we would think it would be just the opposite, but he even uses this to keep us in him. We see in Psalm 119 that, you know, before I was afflicted, I went astray. Um, my comfort is that, that you come and that you are the hope and the peace for me. We looked at each one of those verses last week. I would encourage you to really look at Psalm 119. Also, we looked at some people um, that gave great insights of that. Um, three different individuals um, I encourage you to go back and to look at that and remember that. Well, this morning I want us to look very briefly at a couple of key things that we can learn from this passage. These are truths in the text. You know, every sermon should help you see truths that come out of the Bible. Um, we want the main points of our sermons to be the main points of the text. Um, this text is an interesting text. It's a wide-ranging text. There's some things that about it that are very clear. There's other things about it that are rather ambiguous that we do not know. We're not sure exactly what is being said in some aspects of this text. But here we want to look and we want to see some of the truths that we do know, that we do see. And even next Sunday, we'll cover some things um, that, that really are forces and influences on us that I think Christians need to be aware of. In this. The first point that I want you to see in this text, and, and I want us to see this from verses 13 and 14. Notice the first one and fill this in. Christians are to face each circumstance of life with faith-filled prayer. If you don't get anything else out of these, out of these verses, you need to get this point. Christians, are true Christians, are to face each circumstance of life with faith-filled prayer. Look at verse 13 with me at the top of the page that is there. Look what it says in verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Can you circle the word suffering? Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Circle the word cheerful. Let him sing praise. Number four, verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? So this is a different type of suffering. Suffering may have to do with illness. It may not. There's other ways to suffer. There's a lot of other ways to suffer um, besides being sick. But here we see that sickness, which is a very real one, which is a very personal one, which is a very certain one, because no one lives a perfectly healthy life. And some people, in fact, have tremendous, awesome, incredible burdens that they bear maybe for many years, or that bring their earthly physical demise. Very quickly, look at verse 14. Is anyone among you sick? And here he says, let him call for the elders of the church, let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And then we see, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. So let's look at this. In each circumstance of life, we're called to pray. Number, letter A, are you suffering? Pray. What kind of suffering could it be? Just remember with me, 
James chapter 1, verse 2. And you may want to write that out to the side. James chapter 1, verse 2, and write out there, various trials. Because that's what he says in James chapter 1, verse 2. So he begins his letter saying, Consider it all joy, my brothers, whenever you encounter trials of various kinds. That means everything. That means whenever there's hardship, whenever there's difficulty, maybe it's financial, maybe it's relational, maybe it's in your business, maybe it's, it's in your in your family life with it as extended family or other things like that. Maybe, maybe it has nothing to do with finances or family, but it has to do with other hardships that come your way. There's many different ones. Perhaps it has to do with persecution. That, that, that's not mentioned here as, the, as, as one that's even a big one like sickness is, but persecution was very real then, and it's very real now. This week, I spoke with a young man that his parents have told him he may not come back to Sheridan Hills at all. He has come to faith in Jesus Christ. He has been growing. He's been serving. Very, very balanced. Very, very sharp young man. And he's been told, you may not go back to church. In fact, I've, I've learned of two of those of our young men just in the last week. We have young ladies who have been told by their parents, we don't want you to go to that church. We, you know, we, we are this, they are that. We don't want you to go. And there's been persecution. We have single women in the life of this church that have been divorced because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Their husbands have said, I do not agree with you. I do not believe in you. I'm leaving you. We have people in the life of this church that when their family is together, when their, when their spouse and their children are together at holidays, that they are mocked and laughed at because they will not get drunk with the rest of the family. They will not enter in and, and enter into various just things that are very, very worldly. And, and our church members, I, the ones that I've spoken with are not being unreasonable. They're simply saying, look, I, 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 don't, I don't need to get drunk and I don't need to smoke pot to have a good time with our family. I'm not going to do it. And so as they do not do that, they are ridiculed and mocked because of that. So there's, there's all kinds of suffering that can come. Some of you work in workplaces where your faith has been mocked, and the fact that, that you have certain standards, that you won't lie on certain forms, and you won't tell customers certain things, because you say, I have a great and awesome mighty judge over heaven and earth, and he is good, and he has said that this is not the way to live life, and I will not lie. And you have been mocked because of that. Some of you have lost jobs because of your faith and because of doing the right thing. And that has created great financial pressure upon you. So here he says, is anyone among you suffering? And you could say the answer to that is yes, right? Is anyone among you suffering? Yes. Let him pray. But notice the next one that is there, letter B. Is anyone cheerful? Let him do what? Sing praise. Now, praise is a form of prayer. You're, you're declaring to God that which is right and good. And here we, by putting cheerful in the middle of this, by putting good things in the middle of this, James is saying to us what our main point is. Christians are to face each circumstance of life with faith-filled prayer, whether it's good or bad. And we hear, the, we hear the psalmist write the same thing. In the good times and in the bad, I will praise the Lord. Look at letter C that is here. Is anyone among you sick? And he gives a, an instruction here that involves others because sometimes sickness can be so, so powerful in our lives and, and sometimes it is even a, an urgent sickness or perhaps it is an overwhelming sickness, perhaps a uh, dis disability, debilitating sickness. Look what he says. Call upon the elders or the pastors to pray. Elder and pastor are the same thing. 
There are three terms in the New Testament that are used interchangeably. They're episkopos, presbyteros, and poimen. Episkopos has to do with an intercessor type thing. A, a presbyteros has where we get the word presbytery. Um, this is one of the leaders in the life of the church. Or poimen is the very word for shepherd. Um, all three of these are used interchangeably. Some, peop- some churches call their their leaders, their spiritual leaders, pastors. Some churches call their spiritual leaders elders. Um, but the picture here is the spiritual leaders of the church, those specifically those who teach. Because he who teaches the sheep leads the sheep. He who feeds the sheep leads the sheep. That's the, that's the role of a pastor. That's the role of a spiritual leader. Notice what it says here. Is anyone sick? Let him call on the elders or the pastors of the church to pray. Now, notice who's supposed to do the calling. This is the first one that's under there. Notice, the one who is sick is to call on the leaders of the church to pray. In this context, as James is dealing with this, the picture is here, the direct instruction here is, is that it's the person who is sick that needs to call out for that. It's, it's, you would say, well, wouldn't it be the pastors that would immediately say, hey, let's all get together and go pray? Well, they very well may do that. In the life of our church, we very often do that. But here James has also given us a little picture, a little hint of the person that is the, the Christian that's part of the church. In faith, he is to say, you know, I want people to pray for me. I desire to get well. I want to have relief from this. I... And and part of what James shows us is, is that he is to call upon the leaders of the church to come and to pray for him. Notice the second one that is here, the notice. The ongoing references to sin and sickness throughout this passage. We see it several times. Sin and sickness are very often related. Sometimes sin causes sickness. And in this case, there's excuse me, in this whole text that we're looking at this morning, that may well be part of what James is referencing, is that there's certain things that people were doing, there's certain things that, that brought about a calamity upon them and a sickness upon them. But maybe they got angry, maybe they got in a fight, and in the midst of the fight, they wind up with a broken nose that gets infected, or perhaps they wind up with a broken arm, or perhaps they wind up with some type of debilitating thing that is a result of that, and they would say, okay, well, my sin has gotten me into this. But that's not the only reference that is here. It's There's an if in verse 15. In verse 15, he says, and if he has committed sins. And the idea is, if this sickness perhaps comes from his own sin. So it's not always that case. Sometimes we get sick out of no fault of our own directly. It's part of being part of the fallen race, that we have sickness. And so we we still want to see that this this relationship that is here. Look at verse 15. The circumstances there has, has to be sin um, or has sin. Look at verse 16. Confession of sin to one another is brought up in the midst of this. And it even references over into healing. Look at verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that what? You may be healed. So again, we're not sure exactly what James is referencing here, how specifically. This is, this is where we're, we're looking at some general principles that are here. Look at verse 17 and 18. He gives the example of Elijah, which is a powerful two chapters to read. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 18 is what he's talking about here. You can go back to 1 Kings 17 and 18 and see Elijah praying these enormous prayers and God using Elijah to show his power first and foremost um, over this issue of drought versus rain having to do with a, a wicked nation that is there. And then we see him dealing with the widow that is there that has no food, and Elijah is there, and God comes and miraculously provides, and then the widow's son is raised up to life, and then we see all of the prophets of Baal 
and we see the competition between the God of the Israelites versus the prophets of Baal and whose God is going to win. And Elijah comes and he calls down fire from God upon heaven while the prophets of Baal are doing it. He is mocking them. He is laughing at them. He's saying, what, where? Is your God in the bathroom? Where is he? I mean, there's, a, there's this tremendous power of the life of Elijah, and we're seeing this, and it has to do with the sin and the idolatrous, persecuting nation that is over them. Look at the next point that is here. Is anyone among you sick? Notice that part where it says, anoint with oil. Now, there's much question over what is being spoken of here. What exactly does this mean? What was it meaning then, and what does it exactly mean now? There's a, there's a few options, and I've listed out a few of them, and there may even be more, but you get ready to make some notes and make some things here. Number one, was it medicinal oil where mere physical, with mere physical healing properties? Was this just like medicine? Was this called the elders? You know, they didn't have many medicines then, um, but was this... Was this a medicinal thing that would happen? Would it, did it have to do with, with certain um, skin diseases or various other things? That there, Some people have postulated that it was that. I kind of don't think that that's what it was, but some have said maybe that's what it is. Or the second one that you see here listed, was it sacramental as a means of grace to fight for heavenward flight? The idea is you're about to die and you have to have one of the leaders of the church come and anoint you with oil in order for your soul to make its fight to heaven. Where does that typically come from? Catholicism. What is that typically called? Extreme unction. The idea of praying for those who are imminently about to die, you need that prayer and that helps your soul make it to heaven. Now, friends, I would just say to you, I feel quite certain that's not what this is talking about. First of all, this does not mean that somebody who is sick that is necessarily about to die. But secondly, that would go in the face, and that would go against all that we see about how God saves us. And when we see in the Scripture... But that, is, that second one has to do with the sacramental type element. Well, I don't think it was that. Look at the next one here. Was it part of the sign miracles that validated the gospel message, both while Jesus was alive and during the lives of the apostles? We would see that God, that the Lord Jesus would, would raise someone up and say, are you so amazed at that? And, and he would say, he would talk about forgiveness of sin. And people would say, who is this man who thinks that he can forgive sin? And, and he would do miracles in order for them to see that he's not just a man. We would see that Jesus would raise people from the dead in order to show that he has power over sin and death, power for life. And so we would, we would potentially see that even the apostles in the early years of the church here they are preaching the word of God, and much like Christ was working great miracles through them in order to validate the gospel. I believe that that's part of what we see here in James, very likely. Look at the last one that is here, and I would probably feel most confident that this is part of what we see going on as James is calling us to anoint with oil. Was it a faith marker? Was it a faith marker that underscores a fervent request? I believe that that's perhaps how it is most useful to look at that in this day and time. It would be saying, hey, this person is really sick. And is, as, a, as a statement that we have prayed for this person, that this person would gain relief, that this person would be healed, that we have officially, formally, fervently asked God for their help in this situation, that the, much like we see the anointings of the Old Testament, this person has been set aside, or this person has been set aside for a particular task or a particular role, here we could see that James is talking about, you have formally made a request before God. And so it's, it's a bit of a faith marker, perhaps. However it goes, however it goes, 
Notice this, that it is a fervent issue. The effectual prayer is fervent. More important than anointing with oil would be fervency, I would say. It's the intentional, intense prayer. It's not a canned prayer. It's not a perfunctory prayer. It's not something that we're just supposed to do. You remember that Jesus would say, don't think that God is going to hear you for your many words. Rote prayers that are not from the heart are religious, but they don't represent rep relationship with God. And there's a very big difference. God made us for a, an interactive relationship with him of faith on our part and his blessing and his grace on his part. And so here we see that this issue of fervency is very important. In fact, look at verse 16. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another, one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now look in the middle of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This is the idea of fervency. This is the idea of someone who is the real deal. What James is pointing out here is not an unrighteous person. Not a person who, quote unquote, going back to that modern vernacular now, but not to that fake Christian. He's talking about a real person of prayer, a real person of God, when he asks God, God does great things. And it doesn't matter what generation you're in, God still does that. In fact, he shows that by reaching all the way back where? Into the Old Testament, and he brings up in verse 17, who? Are you all there this morning? Look at verse 17, first word in the sentence. What does it say? Elijah. I want you to see this. James brings up Elijah who comes hundreds and hundreds of years before him in a different picture, in a different setting. But here is the issue. Elijah was a righteous man and he calls upon God. He had a relationship with God. He calls upon God and God comes and shows himself mighty in these things. And so I believe that one of the very first things that we should get in this whole thing is that number one that is there, it's just under truths in the text, Christians are to face each circumstance of life with what kind of prayer? Faith-filled is what I put on there, but you can put on there fervent. That's fine. Fervent prayer, faith-filled prayer. Not just a fake little, well, I prayed, I asked, I did it. No, it may be, I am praying. I am doing it. I am looking to the Lord, and I am asking. Now, we must not forget, last week we looked at how the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, what did he do? He prayed that God would remove this physical problem that he had, so we would believe. What he called a thorn in the flesh. And in fact, the Apostle Paul said, I ask three times, which is kind of that idea of completion in the Hebrew mind. I thoroughly ask, God, would you please remove this thorn in my side, this thorn um, in my flesh that is, that is holding me back? And he said, no, I'm not going to. This has been sent to keep you from exalting yourself. This has been sent to keep you praying. This has been sent to keep you right where you need to be spiritually. If that is removed, perhaps you will not walk with me. You know, Christians need to develop their theology of, prayer, their theology of suffering. We need to see what the Bible says about this. The second thing that we can gain from this, from this passage so clearly, so easily is this. Number two, fill this in. God powerfully answers faith-filled prayer in accordance with his word. And you can put out there in accordance with his will, his word and his will. God answers prayer powerfully. We see that in the book, we see that in First and Second Kings, excuse me, First Kings, verses 17 through 18, the, the story of Elijah. But we also see it in Revelation 21. In Revelation 21, we see that, that 
all of the things that we have ever prayed for, all of the things that in faith that we have brought before God, that they are before his throne. And that he is going to wipe away every tear. And he is going to take away death. He is going to take away sorrow. He's going to take away the suffering. And those will be part of the former things. And we're entering into a time when all of our prayers and all of our suffering and all of our faith will have great reward. And so when God answers prayer, he either does it, sure, in the here and now, but if not in the here and now, he does it in the hereafter. You can fill those two things in. Sometimes your prayer is answered in the here and now. Sometimes the things that you ask for, he grants now. And he does that for his glory and for your good. And there are some times when he says, no, not now, and he grants it in the hereafter. And he does that for his glory and for your good. Same thing. He knows what is best. And we see that over and over and over again in Scripture. I, I just, I've put some names here that I want you to see um, as part of this as well, where, where we just see that God does that, and he does it in a beautiful way. Actually, I'll show you those in just a minute, but look at number three with me. There's a few things that we need to recognize regarding suffering and sickness. Letter A is this. God always rewards our pursuit of him. Always, always, always. God never misses your pursuit of him. God never misses when you have had faith toward him. God never misses your steps, whether great or small, toward him. He always sees it, and he always rewards it. Hebrews 11:6. at the end of the verse, there's just this phrase that got me. The whole chapter of, of Hebrews chapter 11, that whole chapter is about what? Does anybody know what that whole chapter is about? Faith. In fact, we often call it the hall of not fame, but the hall of faith, where the writer of Hebrews goes through the list of those who have trusted in God. And it's this beautiful run-through of the great heroes of faith. But right there at the beginning, he says, faith is with the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things unseen, and without faith, it's impossible to please God, but with faith, everything is possible in this whole process. But here in Hebrews eleven six, at the end, he says, for the Lord is a rewarder of those who seek him. I love those words. He rewards those who seek him. I remember as a college student, when those words hit my heart, I thought, wow, this is hard. It's hard to walk with God. It is hard to continue to pursue him. I keep having my own sin come up. I keep seeing all these other things in life that are possible. I see all these other things. But, but I kept going back to, there was sometimes the question, is this worth it? And the more that I started to walk with the Lord, and the more that I read his word, the more I saw that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He can reward you better than you can reward yourself. He can reward you better than anybody else can reward you. He is the rewarder of those. His rewards are eternal. His rewards are the true rewards that we need to pursue. So just understand in the process and in the look of this whole passage that God is a rewarder of those who pursue him. Letter B fill this in. God often has purposes and plans we do not see. God is the one who knows all things. God is the grand designer of not only the physical creation, but the events of humanity. And God knows things that you don't know. In fact, he knows a lot of things that you don't know. And he knows. Now, I know that 13-year-olds and 14-year-olds have a hard time with this. Um, they think they kind of know better than everybody else. Um, I, we were talking Thursday night with one of the parents, and there was a 13-year-old there, and we were talking. We, they said, you know, and mom said something like, yeah, well, she kind of thinks she knows everything right now, and you know, everybody's kind of laughing, and she's going, well, I do, and, you know, and, 
I, I probably, that kid's gonna hate me forever, but I said, well, you know, when I was a kid growing up, mom and dad, they said from the time you're 13 to the time you're 20, you're not allowed to use two words together. I know. <laughs> we were not allowed to use those two words together. I could not look at dad and go, I know, I know. He, he would not hear, I know. I would go, I am, um, I mean, you know. But you know what, with the Lord, he knows things that we don't know. He sees things coming that we don't see coming. He sees dangers that we don't see as dangers. He knows what's around the next bend. He knows what's just over the cliff. He knows the weak joints that are here that are going to give way that you don't know about. And so for the person of faith, the true Christian that looks to the Lord and prays in every circumstance, we can know that God knows what he's doing even when there's suffering, even when there's sickness, that he knows what he's doing. Look at number, letter C that is here. Letter C. God sometimes grants our requests he sometimes grants our requests, and sometimes he does not. Now, I, I don't have a clue as to how you figure out when he's going to do that and when he's not going to do that, other than to seem to, to stay in his word and stay with him and listen to him. Now, as part of both of these, I, I want you to see a list of names here that as I was praying last night and just kind of thinking about the final parts of the sermon, I want you to see some of these names, that, that God sees things that we don't see coming. Job, by faith, trusted that God knew the big picture. And if you look at all of Job's life, I mean, there was hardship that was there. We talk about the patience of Job. We talk about the suffering of Job. And yet Job goes all the way through it and says, I see that my Redeemer lives, and I see that he is good. What about the next one here? Abraham. I mean, Abraham's called to sacrifice his son. He doesn't see the ram in the thicket. He doesn't know what God is going to do, but he's called to come in faith. And Abraham, time and time and time again, trusts in God, goes out when he doesn't know what is going to be the result. Look at the next one, Joseph. In fact, both Josephs, if you think about it. Old Testament Joseph gets sold into slavery. Old Testament Joseph goes through prison. Old Testament Joseph goes through all of these troubles. He doesn't know that he's going to become the prime minister of, e of Egypt. What about New Testament Joseph? Who's New Testament Joseph? Joseph and Mary. Did Joseph see the end game, Mary's husband? Did he see the end game right away? No. But the Lord comes to him and says, Joseph, hang in there. You, you, you don't see exactly what's going to happen, but don't put Mary away. Don't divorce her. I've got a plan. God in his grace gave Joseph what he needed, both of them. But they couldn't see the end game. Go on to the next one that is there. <laughs> what about Moses? Did he always see what was next? No, but God knew what was next. Just think about his life. What about Gideon? Gideon, send your army home, send your army home, send your army home. And God is saying, I want to show myself great in this. What about the next one, Ruth? Did she understand the end from the beginning and all of this? No, but by faith, she follows God, obeys God, and God blesses her. What about Daniel? You see, Daniel's just like the others. This whole principle. And then look at the next one, Jeremiah. Jeremiah had lots of trouble, often known as the weeping prophet, trouble and hardship in the course of things, and yet God uses him greatly for his glory. Peter, the open mouth, insert foot disciple, <laughs> constantly saying, that, you know, like, oh, Peter, don't do that, and, you know, but yet Peter got it right sometimes, but Peter, I mean, he didn't see everything as it was coming. I mean, he, he had to learn to trust and then I love this one about Martha. Martha wondered, Lord, where were you? Lazarus was sick, and we called for you, and you didn't come. How Martha could have walked away from Christ. How Martha could have forever in her heart rejected him. And yet we see that 
Jesus looks at her and says, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And Jesus looks at Martha and says, Martha, do you believe this? So beautiful. And the thing about Lazarus, he needed to trust in the Lord too, didn't he? <laughs> I mean, he was one of those that died and got risen again. All to show, the week before Jesus would go to the cross for the sins of the world. This is this beautiful picture that God knows what he's doing. He's showing the disciples this precursor. So this week, Lazarus dies and raised again. Next week, it's Jesus who's going to die and rise again. You see, God knows what he's doing. He is weaving his will, and he is weaving his purpose through our lives. And we, if we are believers, if we are true Christians, we need to learn to trust that he, he knows what he's doing. Even when it hurts. Did it hurt for Martha to watch Lazarus die? Yes. I don't know what Lazarus went through. Not sure how painful it was. But Lazarus dies. He goes through death. And God knows what he's doing. And then we see the Apostle Paul over and over and over again in his life. The Apostle Paul sees that God's purpose is he knows what he's doing. I, I, I just want to say that, you know, we have friends in our church that have prayed and prayed and prayed to be able to have a baby and really desired to get pregnant and, and really desired to do that. But then in the process of things, while the pregnancy does not come to fruition, we suddenly see why that may be a blessing as Edward is found to be with cancer. You see, that could be a very, and, and when you listen to Edward and when you listen to Jessica talk about this and talk about their journey, they're saying, you know, we asked so fervently for this thing and we wanted it so very, very much. But now we see that while we wouldn't choose either of these, you know, we know that the Lord is good. And we're thankful that he didn't give the first because the second thing is now here, and we are learning that his ways are best. You see, our lives are filled with examples of where God knows what is best, and we do not. We're welcome to ask, and we, as we ask, if we have a teachable spirit, listen, instead of a demanding spirit, then we learn the way God is. Who are we to tell God what to do? Job would say it this way. Does the pot tell the pot maker how to make him? No. The, the pot doesn't tell the potter what to do. We learn to trust and to walk in faith. Um, I want to encourage you, for some of you, even all these concepts are kind of tough. And we've talked about this book at the beginning of the summer. It's a very, very small book, a very small book, Spectacular Sins by Dr. John Piper. I want to recommend that you get this. It can help you start to have a growing appreciation how God works through the events of human history, how God works through sin, how God works through suffering, how God works through hardship. And the, the answer comes that when we don't have what we're asking for, when we don't have what we want, that as God followers, we need to trust that he knows what he's doing. And he has a grand plan. So I, I'm reminded in this one, I don't have a slide for it, but the, the one by Johnny Erickson Tata and Steve Estes, When God Weeps. Here's a woman who's been in a wheelchair going now, I guess, for 47 or 48 years. And she has... Trust, she trusted in God amidst it all. And she even entitles the book, When God Weeps. And then the subtitle is, Why Our Sufferings Matter to the Almighty. And coming to see that God knows what he's doing in the midst of our suffering and our hardships. Look at the last part that is here. I want you to see this. Letter D. God never misses an opportunity to reveal his glory, to reveal his glory and grow our faith 
in him. He never misses an opportunity for that. You don't need to wonder if God is going to miss an opportunity concerning your request and concerning your sickness and concerning your hardship. God knows all about it, and he knows what he's doing. Job 42 shows us this at the end of the book of Job. After all that's gone through, Job has gone through, and Job sees this. He says, my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. And so it's like Job knew, I, I, I knew logically that you were trustable. I knew logically that I could rest in you. But now, and it was, friends, it was through the suffering that God used the suffering in Job's life to prove his faith. So I don't know where you've been and what you've done. I... I don't know what you've struggled with, but I want you to see what the screen says. True Christians face life. True Christians face life with prayer. Do you face life with prayer? When the bad news comes, do you go to prayer or do you go to despair? When the difficulty hits, do you go to blame yourself or to blame others and to look for the blame that is here, or do you look to God? Sometimes we're tempted to blame God. And we see plenty of examples in Scripture where people have struggled with that. We see where questions have been asked. And we see where God shows us over and over again, if we'll take the time to look and we'll take a life to learn of him, that we will see that he's big enough to handle our struggles and even handle our disappointments. And listen to this, he can even handle our questions if they are made not in rebellion and hate against him, but in faith. We find that he is good and he knows exactly what he's doing. Would you stand with me for prayer?